Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Aaron Davis. I'm the Vice President of Federal Relations here at the International Code Council, uh, sitting in Washington, D.C. today. I um, want to thank you all for joining us for uh, today's webinar, um, preparing for FEMA's Brick Codes Plus Up grant funding. Um, next slide. Uh, well, while we wait for the slide, um, I'll run quickly through the agenda. Um, talk to you a little bit about the speakers and then we'll get into it. Um, so we've got an uh, introduction overview of the FEMA BRIC program, which I'll be talking about um, and uh, as well as uh, our, our friends at FEMA, um, some success stories, uh, uh, an overview of the application process and FEMA GO, which is the system through which you apply uh, or your, uh, your colleagues uh, will apply. Um, we'll hear from 1 of my colleagues, uh, the uh, incredible Stella Carr about how the code council can help you and then we'll open it up to question and answers. Uh, next slide. Um, so, uh, in addition to myself, we've got, uh, like I said, Stella, uh, the energy and resilience project manager here at the ICC. We've got Dr. John Chipperfield uh, from the brick technical services team at FEMA as well as Sean Servas. Um, next slide. And then we've got some uh, success stories uh, from uh, Botetourt, uh County, Virginia, and North Tuella Fire District out in Utah. Um, some successful applicants for past brick cycle grants. Uh, next slide. So, uh, a quick overview about the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Program, uh, which we'll refer to as BRIC uh, for the, the remainder of the call. Um, BRIC has been FEMA's primary pre-disaster mitigation program since fiscal year 2020. It was enacted, uh, it was created um, with the enactment of the Disaster Recovery Reform Act um, in 2018, uh, and by the time uh, FEMA developed uh, the criteria um, and all of the, the uh, requisite uh, materials to formalize the program. Uh, it rolled out in, uh, in FY 2020. Um, BRIC code related activities are low cost, high impact, uh, hazard mitigation. FEMA has said repeatedly that um, investments in, in building codes are sort of the single um, greatest uh, return on investment activity um, that uh, that can be uh, invested in by uh, state, local, tribal, and territorial governments um, for bolstering community and national resilience. Um, and uh, for, I'll take a step back. The ICC was integral in uh, in advancing the Disaster Recovery Reform Act uh, and um, working with Congress to ensure that there was a, a focus on uh, greater resources for pre-disaster mitigation. Um, this has been, uh, you know, multi-decades-long effort on the part of Congress and external stakeholders to uh, ensure that the federal government was putting money into pre-disaster mitigation um, before disaster strikes. Uh, Congress has spent, you know, probably the last two and a half decades since uh, some of the the um, terrible flooding in the late 90s and then uh, subsequent um, hurricane seasons of the early 2000s and 2010s, um, looking at federal disaster uh, response and recovery costs and trying to get ahead of that uh, and make investments on the front end to prevent um, those, uh, those calamitous events from costing federal taxpayers a significant amount of money. And with the Disaster Recovery Reform Act, um, a mechanism was put in place that funds pre-disaster mitigation, funds the BRIC program using a calculation of previous year's disaster uh, response and recovery costs. So it becomes um, a, a program that is self-sustained, and the goal is to, uh, in the long run, reduce federal spending on response and recovery by making those upfront inv investments in mitigation activities. So, in the wake of uh, the establishment of the BRIC program, um, one of the ways that 
the code council engaged Congress was uh, to to look at various mitigation uh, costs um, and or various mitigation projects um, and find which are the 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 greatest bang for the buck for the federal taxpayer and code related activities as I noted um, often have the greatest return on investment so uh, the code council. Um, has been lobbying uh, or lobbied uh, for uh, several years post Dura enactment and over the first couple cycles of the BRIC program to establish a set aside or a, a, a dedicated amount of money for building code uh, related projects um, to to maximize that uh, that return on investment for um, taxpayers. Last year, um, much to uh, our um, joy uh, and celebration, uh, FEMA established a building code plus up section of the, the BRIC grant um, funding opportunity for FY23. Um, our friends from FEMA will talk about some of the successes uh, that they've seen, but uh, why don't we go to the next slide? And here is sort of an overview uh, over the, the various cycles of BRIC, um, showing what that total federal investment through BRIC in code related activities uh, or projects was. So, um, the most recently closed BRIC cycle, the FY23 cycle, the, was announced last October. Uh, the application period closed at the end of February this year. And a couple months ago, FEMA released um, sort of the, the grand total of code related. Uh, projects, as well as the, the tally, um, there was uh, over 100 million dollars available, um, 52, nearly 53 million of which um, was applied for and, and selected for uh, for awards um, or for further review. Um, but uh, while 53 out of you know, 126 million um, is uh, is a fraction, it's uh, on orders of magnitude greater than the, the first three cycles of BRIC combined, um, which is uh, an incredible success and I think speaks volumes to the, the pent up demand uh, in communities to seek resources for code related uh, either adoption or enforcement activities um, or updating of their codes. Uh, next slide. So. Um, some stats here about the last cycle of uh, the of BRIC and the building code plus up. 94% of applications building code plus up dollars were successful. Uh, 43 states and territories took advantage of that set aside uh, and put it to use. 70% of the awards came from 29 state agencies. Uh, six state agencies maxed out their their set aside, so that was two million dollars uh, for for each of six state agencies. Um, and then, unfortunately, uh, and this is where we see room for improvement uh, in the FY24 cycle, once that is announced, 11 states didn't use any of their uh, code-related funds. Um, and from an ICC perspective, uh, during the last FY, during the last BRIC cycle in FY23, there were 51 successful projects uh, that ICC uh, assisted applicants with. Applicants and sub applicants. Um, so, next slide. And this is uh, an overview um, of code awards to date based on cycle of the BRIC program. So, we see some opportunity for improvement uh, there in the, the middle of the country, and uh, we stand ready um, to assist uh, interested parties in those states, as well as the other states that have already received awards. Um, to advance additional code uh, code related project applications. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to our friends from FEMA uh, to talk about uh, BRIC and FEMA Go and the application process. Hello, everyone. Um... Again, thanks, Aaron. I'm John Chipperfield. I work for uh, FEMA headquarters at BRIC, and I work for the technical services team. And hope everyone's having a great Tuesday. 
Um, I'm a bit under the weather, so um, please bear with me. Um, so uh, next slide, please. So today I'm going to go over a few things, um, a brief overview of the Brick Building Code Plus Up. Aaron kind of did a, a pretty good job of it earlier, but I'm going to reiterate some of that stuff. And um, how the FY23 Brick Building Code Plus Up went, uh, a few things about what to anticipate in the future, and also some key resources um, for you to use. Next slide, please. And next slide. This is just a section slide. So to start off, um, Brick is new as of um, FY23. And so if you haven't heard about Brick's Building Code Plus Up, it was introduced in FY23 to help communities enhance their building codes and capabilities with dedicated funding sources. And in previous BRIC cycles, this was only able to be done through the state and territory allocation or the tribal set aside. So having this allocated funds really gives communities a better opportunity to access funds for building codes. So with that being said, the building code plus up is similar to the state and territory allocation from previous fiscal years, with a big exception being that this funding is solely dedicated to the building code activities and cannot be used for anything else. Um, so um, for this fiscal year, or for fiscal year 23, um, if you, states could apply for building code plus up, and if they, happen to be oversubscribed in the building code plus up, the states could still use some of the allocation money to fund some building code activities. Um, that's up to the state's discretion on where they want to put their allocation money, but um, that's still a possibility. So you theoretically could have more than $2 million in funding towards building codes. And um, the adoption and enforcement of building codes um, specification and standards is an important mitigation activity that provides significant resilience benefits. And currently, many tribal nations, territories, and communities are using BRIC funds to adopt or enhance their current building codes. And as Aaron mentioned earlier, too, um, there was a huge turnout for this building code plus up in fiscal year 23, even though it was only introduced last year. And hopefully, in future cycles, if we're still offering this funding, it will be a way for communities to get more money out for, um, for building code activities. Next slide, please. So we understand the importance of building codes when it comes to resilience, and the purpose is to encourage building code adoption and enforcement activities in three main areas. So evaluating the adoption and implementation of codes that reduce risk, enhance existing adopted codes to incorporate more current requirements or standards, and also to develop a professional workforce capabilities through like technical assistance and trainings. So for instance, many communities don't just focus on doing one element. So most of the sub applications that we saw in fiscal year 23, they encompass multiple areas um, such as a community that didn't have current codes would try to see which codes would be best for them. And also to, in, in addition, would also do like trainings and uh, try to develop their workforce capabilities through trainings. And also some of them also did um, a lot of like permitting and um, code cycle or permitting and the, the addition of um, virtual inspections and things like that. Next slide, please. And so for, Aaron also mentioned this, but for fiscal year 23, <clears throat> building a code plus up, FEMA kind of has reduced the complexity of the BRIC grant program and increased access to funding and it's that's what this building code plus up is and brick received 137 sub applications for more than 57.6 million dollars um, for the new plus up 
<coughs> sorry. <clears throat> um, and this is the largest amount that has ever been requested for building codes. But as Aaron mentioned earlier, um, 129 were actually selected for further review and totaling around 53 million. This aligns with FEMA's goals to increase the adoption and enforcement of stronger building codes and standards. It also supports the Biden-Harris administration's interagency efforts through the National Initiative to Advance Building Codes. Um, as a comparison, in fiscal years 2020 through 2022, the program received only 49 sub-applications for building code activities. So in fiscal year 23, we received more than two and a half times the amount of sub-applications for building codes than in the three cycles, pr three previous cycles combined, which is an incredible accomplishment. And hopefully in the future, we're gonna see more because um, it's gonna be wider known and wider spread for all communities to get some funding to help with their building codes. Um, sorry, back one slide. So, um, with fiscal year 23, we had sub applications ranging in federally requested funds from very small to very large. So we had some small applications that were only asking for a few thousand dollars to just get building codes for their department, like copies of building codes. And it ranged all the way up to like states requesting the full amount to update their codes from a previous, previously outdated edition to the latest. Also within the FY23 brick cycle, we had a few economically disadvantaged rural communities or EDRCs that created sub applications and EDRCs are communities that are below the national income level with a population of 3000 or lower. And so we had a few of those applications that were able to update their codes and standards. So this funding is really for any community that wants to make the next step to a more resistant codes or to bring awareness on how important codes are in their communities. Next slide, please. So what's coming up is um, um, so unfortunately the FY24 brick NOFO or notice of funding opportunity has not been released yet. So I won't be able to go into too many specifics, but what I can tell you is that the brick building code plus up is anticipated to continue for FY24 and that it will be structured very similarly to what was done for FY23. Um, there was some, some advanced information, um, that was sent out, um, about pro program priorities and areas of focus so that communities can get started on preparing for the upcoming grant cycle. Next slide, please. So on this, on this slide, um, these are some resources. Um, they are pretty much, since we haven't released the new NOFO, the, Brick web page will be updated once that is released to show the new NOFO and also to um, have some updated program, su program support material. Um, but with this, the mitigation ac action portfolio gives some examples of selected projects. Um, and then the Brick program support materials, the PSMs, they have a specific building code activities PSM, which will give some insight into eligible project types and a non-exhaustive list of some examples that will give you some ideas of what can be done. So um, these resources will be incredibly helpful if you're trying to develop a building code plus a sub-application. And um, I would just recommend, highly recommend going to use these, even the, the Fiscal year 23 is a very good resource to use and to look into while you're developing a um, sub application before the um, FY24 information is released. But that is it for me. And I think is Sean up next.
Yes, we can go to Sean next and um, I think we might just need to swap for him to share his screen and give us a FEMA go walkthrough. So, um, and he'll share more about the application process. Thanks, John. Hey, everybody. <clears throat> Excuse me. Can I get an audio check, please? We can hear you. Okay, great. So. I don't have a ton of time to go through. Oops, that's not what I want to do. Um, I want to share my screen. I'll try to give you a brief overview of um, the, the FEMA Go system and what it's going to look like for you to create a, a sub application for building codes. So this is the FEMA Go system, obviously, that hosts the BRIC program. And for you guys externally, it's going to be go.fema.gov. And you're going to go here. It's going to look like this. And you're going to need, if you don't already have an account, you're going to need to sign in with login.gov. This is new this year. And if you previously had a FEMA Go account, you're going to need to make sure that your email address that you used with the FEMA Go system is associated with your login.gov account. And they've got really good instructions on how to do all that stuff on our uh, on our user guide website here. I can put a link to this guy in the chat for everybody. And here we go. Put that in there. It kind of walks you through all of those those steps. It's just like signing up for any other web page, except there's that multi-factor authentication using login.gov. So I'm going to jump over to the test environment so I can actually drive around. And of course, in the test environment, it's a little bit different. I don't go in this way. I go in with a username and password, and that's fine. All right, and then this is the home page when you first log in, depending on what permissions you have. You'll have all of your open funding opportunities listed over on the right hand side over here. And then things that you've already started will be visible here in this home page, whether if you're at the state level, you could have an active grant or if you're at the local level, you're probably only going to have sub grant, sub grants. And if you've gotten something that's been awarded, it's going to be in my awards. So you've got three different things there. So if we go on down, I'm going to have to scroll way down here to find it because this is the test environment to find one of these funding opportunities that we've used for testing that actually works. And if I don't get to it quick, I'm going to search for it. Here we go. So when the, the funding opportunity opens this year, you'll, depending on your roles, you'll see either the ability to start a sub application or both the ability to start an application and a sub application. But to, to work on a building codes sub application, you, that's what you're going to want to click right here. Start sub application. And this is the sub application initiation page so here it asks you who you are and who you're applying to right because sub applications are um they're since brick is a pass-through program your sub application at the local government is going to flow up to the state and then they're going to submit the whole package up to fema where if it was a direct grant program you might just apply directly to fema so you're going to be creating a sub application that's going to go up to the state and then on to FEMA eventually. So for this little exercise, I am going to just use my main test account. And this is valid too, right? You can, a, an organization like a state or a tribe they can also create their own sub applications. But let's do loading codes. Um, 
All right. So this this part is important right here, the sub application type. Once you make a selection here, you can't go back and change it. So we want to get it right the first time. And for building codes, they had to put it somewhere. So they put it in a project sub application. It's kind of fitting a square peg in a round hole. And I'll go through some of the details on that. But it's uh, they had to put it somewhere. They chose to put it in a project. So go ahead and pick a project sub application. And then we're going to start the sub application. Then you can see all the sections on the left hand side here, all the different sections of the sub application, and there's a whole bunch of them. And like I said, some of these things are kind of weird um, because we're we're doing something that it's a little bit uh, unconventional, I guess, for projects of applications. Usually when we're talking about projects, we're talking about some kind of surface disturbing activity or um, whatever. But in this case, we're talking about building codes. So I'm just going to run through these sections real quick. And Try to drive fast here so you guys we can focus on the important stuff. Hmm, that's interesting. Okay. does want two phone numbers and an address. And then we'll go ahead and continue on through the other sections. This is where you identify the communities that are associated with this activity. It could be uh, that your your building codes proposal is going to affect the whole state or a large area, or it could be uh, for a specific entity. So you could either select all, or you could go through and find the individual entities that you would be you're working on. So then I have to zoom all the way down to the bottom. and add my community. I'll go to my mitigation plan. And someone, you guys will have to, I don't remember the planning requirements for a building codes. I, that might come out in the NOFO, whether or not a mitigation plan is required for those types of applications. All right, here we are in the scope of work section. And this is where we identify that this is in fact a building code sub application. And we're gonna do that in our primary activity type. And just as a little side note, if you need to change the title of your sub application, you can do that right up here at the top of the page. There, here we go. They uh, added the proposed that activity type as codes and standards. That's what you would want to select for building codes. And then it's going to ask you what type for the sub activity under those codes and standards. And these are your options. So, and you could have multiple, I think you could go up to three or four if you choose to do so in op as optional fields. And then the rest of the questions are in the scope of work are going to get into the who, what, why, where, and when, and how, and all that stuff on how you're actually going to perform this proposed mitigation activity for building codes. This gets into community lifelines and could be, uh, <laughs> 
a number of different things, probably safety and security would be a good one. And like I said, this is a little bit unconventional, um, some of these questions. So, you know, you can explain that away in your in your application. And then here I get to make my little joke that we're going to be mitigating against zombies. You can have multiple hazard sources. I think you can have three. And Again, more questions that are related to a conventional project more than building codes. So phase projects, or if you're doing construction, how much of your population is affected by this? And then all those who, what, how, where, and when, why questions down at the bottom. The uh, So like, like I've said already a couple of times, some of these questions are talking about things that are specific to physical, uh, quote unquote, yellow metal madness projects on the ground that aren't really related to building codes. So you can have a conversation with your, your region program folks about what's appropriate for, for some of these questions. So I am just going to blow through them all real quick. The schedule is pretty straightforward. Don't spend much time here. I'm going to save the task. Again, location. This is, you know, we're not doing, we're not a mini, we're not doing a neighborhood acquisition here for flood control, right? We're, we're doing a paperwork exercise. So you might go into a description about where the codes will go into effect and that kind of stuff, but it's, it's not going to be, a, um, this section wasn't designed specifically for building codes. I had a quick question, um, yeah. Sean. Um, when you were pulling up uh, the information on the community on the previous uh -huh. um, page, does that pre-populate or is that just showing up um, because you have this sort of uh, test page? Yeah, that, that's actually pulled from the community information system. And so if you don't, if you don't find your exact community in, in there, that's okay. Just pick the closest thing and, and uh, make a comment that it's it's the closest thing. Okay, and then when filling out the point of contact area, also on that previous page, is that mm -hmm. where the building department would put their information if they're the applicant? That's right. So some of that information might come from SAM.gov based on the information they have about their entity in SAM.gov. And, uh, but if you need to enter an individual point of contact for that, then you could do that here. Okay, thank you. You're we welcome. might pop in with some more questions. Yeah, please do. Everybody feel free to, to speak up, ask yeah, questions. Uh, folks, there's a Q&A function as well. If you have any questions um, based on what Sean is showing us, we can try to address those. So here's a, uh, something that you, is handy about the, the new uh, sub application in FEMA Go is, is this project site inventory isn't required, right? So we're not really doing an, a, a yellow metal madness project, like I said. So 
no would be a perfectly acceptable answer here. That we don't have a project site inventory to fill out. Continue. For some reason, it took me back up to the top of the page. And then I'll create a budget. There's there's two different cost types that we can add. First, we have to add something to the cost estimate, and then we can add our subrecipient management costs. So I'll go ahead and add an item here. Give a description. So now that I've added one item to my cost estimate, I get that button again to add the cost type. So I can add my subrecipient management cost. And I can add an item to that. And you right. can save these um, pages and come back to it, correct? That's right. This is all hosted on Amazon Web Services, so it saves automatically every two seconds. And it also saves when you click something like this continue button right here. So if you right. get called to the front desk or something and you leave your computer and come back an hour later, it'll still be there after you log in again. I'm sure that's helpful for people to know. And that way, if you, if you were getting started on the application, but you don't yet have all the budget numbers worked out, you can, you know, work on that in a spreadsheet and then come right back and continue filling out that information. Here, I'm just identifying the source of my non federal share. If that's applicable, we'll see what comes out in the NOFO this year, the notice of funding opportunity. Continue, and this is another one. I know last year this was not applicable, um, and for for building codes that you did not have to do a benefit cost analysis. And hopefully that's the same way again this year. So we can just say not applicable to the benefit cost analysis. And keep on trucking. <clears throat> so the, this one is where it really gets a little weird. Um, EHP is not going to review these things, right? We're talking about a paperwork exercise. So we're going to answer no to a lot of questions. Where, you know, if we were doing a, a traditional project on the ground, a lot of these things would require significant reviews from our EHP staff. And there's a whole bunch of them. Timmy, these are the technical Hi, Sean, evaluation. Sean, could you ask, yep. or could you um, ex spell out what EHP means? Sure, that's our environmental and historic preservation team at FEMA. They do the reviews for all the regulatory things that apply to federal funding for environmental historic, all the all the different acts, the coastal management zones, CERCLA, RICRA. Uh, you know, there's a whole a whole bunch of things here, half of the alphabet that they have to go through to make sure we're covered under all of these things. So um, if you answer yes to these, it's going to ask you for more information about whatever the question is. So I'm just going to say no to keep this brief for everybody. Because you guys are you've going to talk about success stories after this, right? So I need to keep trucking. There's Thank a summary you. of your your comments and attachments. And then it gives you your assurances and certifications. We can continue through that. So we're ready for signature. 
I can submit for signature and it will take me back up to the top of the sub application. And this is this task is what will put it in the state's queue for review and approval and, and submission to FEMA. Uh, it's worth pointing out that while you have this draft sub application here, the state can also come in and work on it with you simultaneously, like Dropbox or Google Drive or something like that, because this is cloud hosted. You guys can be in here working on the same application at the same time, or they can be reviewing your work. The only times that gets weird is if you're actually on the same editing, trying to edit the same field together, you'll get an error message, but that's pretty much to be expected. Do that and we can submit this guy. And it has been submitted to the recipient. So at this point, the state can edit this, or in this case, my tribal person, when they're doing the review task, they can continue editing that sub application. They can send it back to you if they want you to make the edits, or they can just review and approve it and send it on to FEMA. So that was kind of a whirlwind through that. Hope everybody stuck with me. And if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thanks, Sean. Why don't we take um, a couple minutes to see if anyone has any questions? Hopefully, um, this is helpful just so you know sort of what the application is. If you've never gone through FEMA Go before, obviously, you can revisit this recording and um, reach out to your state contact or FEMA Go support if you run into any issues as you do um, apply. But wanted to make sure that you got exposure to sort of the different types of information that you'll need for the application portal and uh, what that process looks like. So again, feel free to en enter any questions in the chat um, and we can also address them later on if there's any that come up. Um, but in the meantime, we can transition our slides back over to. Um, Actually, let's let's. Um, Sean, could you put that back up? Oh, sure. Could we go back to the community section? I just. Um, oh, yes, your question. Yes. Um, so. When you clicked through that kind of quickly, I feel like there was some pretty important information in there. Um, it has um, CRS rating, yes or no. If if somebody comes across, is, first of all, is this information weighted in any way? Um, and if they come across a error, um, how do they ensure that gets changed? Um, and also last year, I believe, there was something about asking about yes or no, whether or not they adopt um, the I codes, the internet ICC international um, suite of codes and um, what edition year it was. Um, and I was wondering if that was pre-populated or if we just zip past that somehow. It's not pre-populated. It's one of the questions in the evaluation okay. section down here. And if you answer yes to this question, it'll prompt you to enter more information about that. And the community section is, isn't important at all. It's okay. just to identify where the work is taking place. Perfect. Thank you. It's, I would say it's probably the least important section of a sub application. Okay, thank you. We're going to transition now to the success stories so that you can hear from a couple of peer organizations who have successfully applied to BRIC. They have navigated FEMA Go and they made it out the other side, so you can too. Um, we'll hear from uh, Tuella and the Badada, we practiced this before, um, hopefully I got it right, um, and we'll get those slides up and hear from them. Um, but in the meantime, why don't we have um, 
our friends over in Utah come on camera and uh, introduce yourselves. You can share with us um, about your organization and who we have um, on the call with us today. Perfect. Uh, Stella, can you hear us? Yep, we can hear you. Awesome. Um, so my name is Kevin Nunn. I'm the fire chief for North Tuella Fire District in Northern Utah. And the slide you're looking at right now is related to uh, the big outline is our county. Uh, so the, the blue at the top, that is the Great Salt Lake. Um, and the the green and, and yellow, or sorry, green and orange uh, areas are the population centers. Um, the rest of our county that extends along I-80 is just West Desert um, and like 98% um, unpopulated. Um, we're, we've got, uh, we're considered rural mountainous uh, desert and um, the, it is basically to the south uh, of the Great Salt Lake and to the west of Salt Lake City. Um, so uh, our county is about 1,700 square miles, uh, very large, uh, but the population center is fairly concentrated. Um, so that's, that's really an overview uh, of who we are and, and where we're at. Um, the, with kind of a, as a panel today, um, you can see our, our group uh, picture there, um, or our group uh, uh, video in the background is I've got our fire marshal, our deputy chief, uh, our grants manager, and myself um, to, to give kind of a, a brief overview on what we did for our proposal um, and uh, answer some of the questions that uh, Stella wanted us to kind of focus on. Um, so, so tell us about your brick proposal. Okay, so um, on the slide here, um, we're replacing 263 key lock boxes um, to update our, our fire department access hardware. So um, we are in a growth explosion uh, because we're immediately west of Salt Lake City. Um, and uh, up until up until recently, or in the last five years or so, um, this area has been pretty much considered the Wild West. And so now that we've got growth, both residential and commercial, uh, coming uh, kind of through the roof, uh, so to speak. Um, we, we know and we've done a needs analysis on the things that we see, and one of those is codes compliance, uh, codes enforcement, codes creation, um, codes adoption. And, and so um, to really focus on our commercial occupancies that are, that are increasing uh, exponentially, um, we wanted to address an outdated system um, and an adequate system that did not allow the fire department to access uh, a building after hours or uh, when it, d during unoccupied times. Um, so it, it, our, our entire uh, program was really focused on um, adding some fire inspectors, um, adding the, the key boxes to the fire department address, project management, electronic locks, um, and, and a public outreach uh, message system. So, you know, we, we wanted to kind of show all those elements and how much it was, uh, how much it was going to cost and how much uh, we were, uh, we were really trying to convert an inadequate system, adopt codes, um, enforce codes and, and bring all that together before we really have a crisis out here. Um, and sorry, we, we didn't think to mute the overhead speakers. Sorry. Um, what, and then the next question was who or what encouraged us to apply for brick? Um, well, that would be a general email that went out uh, probably nationwide um, that explained what BRIC and CODES Plus App was um, through the, um, the IAFC um, and the, uh, uh, the, the Chief's Council there. Um, and uh, once it did that, it kind of directed us to the ICC. 
we uh, reached out to uh, Stella, uh, as uh, I think um, Aaron Davis referred to her earlier as the incredible Stella Carr. Um, and she was uh, very, very helpful. She redirected us to our state contact um, and our state contact um, guided us through the process. Um, so um, with those two things being said, I want to really um, turn a moment over here to our fire marshal who can answer uh, why, why the funding is so important. So Chief's uh, gone through the slide and, and talked a lot about why the funding is so important to us. Uh, this explosive growth that he alluded to is really, um, you know, we're, we're doubling and maybe even quadrupling uh, our residents in commercial space. So what this, why this funding is so important to us is, is currently, I'm, I'm kind of a one man show, um, really covering, co covering hundreds of square miles of, of space. And this is gonna allow us to get on top of that, uh, get our mitigation efforts, um, get ahead of the curve a little bit. Uh, you know, uh, Chief talked about some of the, the Knox boxes, but, but it will also allow us to hire some uh, inspectors and uh, you know, just stay ahead of that growth. So I'm really excited to see this. That being said, would lead us to the final question, which is uh, uh, what did you wish to know before you applied? And I'll turn that to Kim. Hi, um, Kim Clausing. Um, I wanna add to that real quick before I talk about what I wish I knew. We at North Tooele are considered um, a wooey area. So we have wildland fire problems. And so a lot of our growth is budding up against our foothills where we have a huge wildland fire problem. We um, received a grant from the US Forest Service to help um, get information out to our community about wildfire problems. But along with that, um, our fire marshal Buck has had some large buildings that are budding up against you know, this wildfire zone. And so we need codes enforced that they have some type of fire mitigation in place that um, helps in case we have large events of fire. And a bunch of our crew right now are actually in Idaho helping fight those wildfires. So this kind of code enforcement is really important and important for us to let our community understand why we enforce these codes is just to save property, save lives and, and, and make our community a safer place to live. So part of what I wish I knew before we applied um, I wish everybody had a Stella. <laughs> Stella was amazing. Um, she led us to um, Eric um, with the state of Utah, Eric um, Martineau, and he was so helpful in the application of this. I would say the things that you need to know if you've never applied for a FEMA grant or make sure you go to the FEMA Go webpage and understand beforehand, give yourself plenty of time, understand beforehand what documents you're gonna need um, and also the relationship with other agencies is so important. We didn't only apply for this for our jurisdiction, we applied for it for our whole county. And so we didn't want to just um, leave out, you know, the cities that our two city, major cities here actually have volunteer departments. So we included them as well. So we partnered with them. Um, also just your state and your federal agencies for like, um, Tooele County has a pre-disaster mitigation plan, which was important to know that they had some of, of your different documents that you're going to need to apply for. Make sure relationships with other agencies are there in place, because if you have someone you can contact on the fly and say, listen, do you have this mitigation plan? Do you have this documentation? Is so helpful. So, you know, relationships with other agencies in your jurisdiction, in your state, and even at the federal level with Stella are really important. So the things you wish you knew beforehand, relationships are important. Okay. I think that um, that, that, that really, um, one of the things that uh, Buck did not say, our, our fire marshal did not say, um, that he did say he's a one man band, but he also um, could include that, that this is the first time we've ever had a, a full-time fire marshal to work through some of these codes. And so just in the last year and a half, um, our, as, uh, as Kim pointed out, is that our agency is the only non-federal 
a full-time agency in the county. And so by partnering with some of the other volunteer agencies, um, we were really able to expand the, the program and really able to uh, uh, put that uh, uh, to good use. So um, this has been a great process um, and, and our state uh, really um, was able to help a lot. So I, we appreciate it. Um, anything else we, that you'd like us to cover, Stella? That was wonderful. Um, we'll, we'll see if anyone has any questions for you after the next, um, next presentation. And then, um, if there's anything else that comes up, feel free to jump in. So I appreciate that. It was great, um, summary. Hopefully that was inspiring for some others and we'll pass it over to our, um, other presenters from Bonita, Virginia. Good afternoon. Uh, this is Matt Lewis, and I'm here with John McCoy from Buttertop, Virginia. I'm operations support coordinator in our community development department. He's our planning supervisor. I'll give you a very short background on Buttertop. We cover 546 square miles, and we're to the northeast. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm getting over something as well of the city of Roanoke. And back in 1770, the boundaries reached as far west as the Mississippi. So there's a chance some people on this call were a part of that land at some point in time. Uh, our journey for this grant process started from one of the PDF fact sheets that was on ICC's website. And it just gave a little bit of a prompt and we explored it from there. We are a small team. We only have five people in our building department and six people in our planning and zoning. So we wear a lot of hats. I can em uh, empathize with Ken and Kim, what you guys were saying. Uh, the focus of our grant was primarily on tools and training, physical code books, study materials, uh, the associated training and exam costs that created a foundation. And then we built on from there. It was at an advantageous time when we had a change in our permitting and code enforcement software coming up. So we included that. And then we were asked to think a little bit larger. So we looked at large sized plan review monitors, displays, as well as supplies for our building safety month. And lastly, <clears throat> we had a structure collapse on Thanksgiving day last year and access to it was prohibited other than by drone. And if it wasn't for the nice folks in our fire department, we wouldn't have been able to have the interior pictures that we do. So that request was placed into the, into the grant as well. Our um, proposal came in a little over 112,000 for FEMA share, 37 for ours, uh, right under 150,000 total. You ask who encouraged us to apply for the BRIC grant? Our spark moment, you could say, came from that PDF that was mentioned earlier, and also the ICC's website that laid out previous successes, <clears throat> much as we're doing here today. I was able to take those tools and champion it to the leadership in our department, and they agreed to go ahead with uh, exploring the opportunity. Also, Virginia Emergency, the Virginia Department of Emergency Management have two staff members, Debbie and Lauren. I want to shout out because without their consistent encouragement and positivity, I wouldn't have been able to go through all the different steps. Uh, the thorough documentation on FEDA, FEMA and VDEM's websites were also able to encourage us to go through with the application. The funding will take a department that's been working with very little as far as uh, the different capacities that we have, books, computers, and the like, and allow us to catch up to modern times as a locality with floodplain, wind, erosion concerns. Uh, resilient building is very important to us. And before I applied, two things stand out. I wish I had known it had been written for over a three-year period. I found that out near the end, and I was able to include that in our application, but I didn't think big enough in some of the different things we ask for. And uh, Ken, actually, some of your comments just now, I didn't think about going, reaching over the aisle to the fire department, so to speak, and looking at the fire marshal. We don't have funding for one right now. We don't have a fire marshal in Botetourt County, and that would be a great benefit to the building department as well. If I was gonna provide some advice for people, be intentional with your scope, determine 
how you want to structure your application. Make sure you can make a good case for what you are doing. Um, focus on the, the simple, straightforward items, the highest impact per dollar. That way the people reviewing it can understand and support what you're going for. Reaching out to your state hazard mitigation officer early is key. Um, I had to reach out to a few people to find the correct one, but they were very informative and very helpful. If you're looking for help within your locality, start with the fire and EMS department. If anyone has had to put in grants in the past, they are probably it, and they can help you with some of those parts. Um, look for unique timing. With our grant opportunity, it was advantageous with the changeover for our permitting code enforcement software. And lastly, expect an acronym overload. Every field has them, this one has it, and it can be easily overcome with just a little bit of research. In closing, I would like to just say, just apply, just start it. You don't have a lot to lose other than some time. Get the pre-application or application out there, depending on what dates that are set by your state if they are the ones passing along the application to FEMA. And it doesn't matter what your background is. Um, Ken and Kim have a lot of experience. I'm on the other end. I've been in government for three, four years, and I don't have any background in grant applications. I have an associate's degree, but I took the detailed oriented nature of how I think and process things and just stayed persistent with it. They want to see these programs succeed. So go for it. John, would you like to add anything to that? Sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to do so. Um, I just want to reinforce and reiterate uh, the importance of having a person on staff like Matt Lewis. Um, his dogged determination, uh, determinism and ability to kind of um, just parse through all the complex data and information and stay on top of things is uh, just unique and incredibly valuable. When you're applying for a grant like this, um, so my role is more supervision on this, and I've luckily just been able to um, support Matt in the best way I can um, as he kind of works through the process and gets all the information together. So it's been a really great um, process to just help support and make sure I stay out of the way and make sure that he's able to do what he needs to do to get the grant done. So um, it's an awesome opportunity for Botetourt County, and like you said. Um, you don't lose anything by going through the process, doing some research, and trying to hunt for the information. So I would encourage anybody to do so. Thank I'll give it back so over to you, Stella. Thank you. Thank you for that feedback. It sounds like uh, it's important to highlight the internal expert and champion as well. So thanks for pointing that out. Um, we did have a question come in um, for both of our community presenters on the local match. How were you able to secure the local match for funds or how do you plan to, um, what do you plan to use for that? If you could share on um, that point would be appreciated. Yes, the local match is coming in the form of where we had planned to change over our software system. We had allocated some funds for that, so when this opportunity came online, it was just good timing. We were able to reallocate and make that into the match that we needed, and we will actually use less in the process. Um, as far as our district, um, you can go so far as to approach uh, the county council and get that get everything approved ahead of time um, and and really like Kim was talking um, about the uh, the partnerships and those are really really important um, my the way I've, I've handled things in the past um, have been so, to uh, solidify all that uh, up front um and then there's been other grants that i have submitted and just said you know we'll do time we'll we'll handle it with um uh, in-kind resources and and our time that we spend um so it can it can be a lot i i would encourage you not to let the match prevent you from applying that that's one of the things that i've always kind of felt 
Thank you. Um, and there was a question about timeline. So I'm going to go over sort of the overall brick timeline. And then I'd love to hear from our success stories on sort of what your internal timeline was, because I know everyone seems to find out about this opportunity, perhaps at different times, and there are different deadlines. So um, just so everyone is aware, sort of the as you heard from John earlier, we don't yet have the notice of funding opportunity for fiscal year 24. Um, but what I'll share is from previous years, once that does come out, um, which will be sometime this fall, uh, all goes well, um, then every state um, in that NOFO, there will be a deadline that FEMA sets in which the states have to submit all of the sub applications to FEMA. Last this year uh, for fiscal year 23, um, it was February 2024 um, was a deadline for FEMA. And so what happens is each state has their own internal deadline. Um, as you heard earlier, you're a sub applicant to your state's hazard mitigation office or whatever office it is that um, is the FEMA designee and they um, have the flexibility to set whatever internal deadlines they would like for either a notice of intent. So um, we do have a resource available, um, which we can link to that shares deadlines that we are able to see um, for different states. Some of them have passed, some of them are coming up, some of them may be flexible, um, but we see that there is about, um, you know, it could be a couple months, it could be several months. Some of the deadlines are much sooner than that February deadline. Um, but whenever that is, you'll have the time to submit your application to the state and then they do their internal review and then we'll um, submit that to FEMA. Once the FEMA deadline happens, it's several months that they review it internally um, before um, applicants are notified if they're selected for negotiation or further review, um, and then that process begins. So I believe um, both of our presenters today were notified a couple months ago, I, I don't recall the date, but sometime this summer, um, that they were selected for further review. And again, that they may have submitted earlier to their state and then that application went into FEMA. Now that means they were selected for further review. At this stage, they both are not able to call themselves awardees because the contracts are not signed and finalized. They're still working through things with FEMA. Um, perhaps they can share an update if uh, they've heard anything else when they um, share their own timeline. But once that process continues um, at this point, probably won't be until beginning of 2025 that they can sort of start the work on these projects. So um, it's about a year, uh, at least a year long process from sort of when you apply to when you hear back. Um, but I'd love to hear from our success stories. Um, if you would share sort of when you, if you can remember um, when you heard about it, about how long it took you to apply and then um, what that waiting period has been like. I'll, I'll go first. Um, from from North Tuella's perspective, um, I think I think we reached out to Stella the end of November, and um, one thing that accelerates uh, or has accelerated things on our end is that um, our fire district has gone through a an extensive needs analysis. And so for all of our high needs, we've already written a grant that, um, or we've written a narrative which speaks to that. And so uh, when we find grant funding, we're able to just uh, work within the, that main uh, narrative a, a little bit and tailor it to each direct um, uh, uh, agency or a funding um, opportunity. So that we already know what we're applying for and what we need, um, and and so that means that uh, we have about uh, 12, 12 narratives that are ready to go for any particular agency that is able to fund it in that particular direction. We knew that we had a codes need. We saw this funding. We thought oh, that's a great opportunity. Um, so we didn't have to spend. Um, between a month and two months of just writing a narrative, we already had that, um, which is going to be the bulk of anybody's application is it's going to take, take time 
to, to get that narrative finalized. So from the time we contacted Stella to the time we actually applied with the state was about 60 days. Um, and then the state, um, the state had a review, a deadline of mid January. Um, and then what they did was run it through a third party, uh, that, that, uh, understands the FEMA application process for brick. They fed back to us um, that information on what we needed to to do to solidify our grant, and then we final we we sent it in that that last week in February. So um, I hope that answered some questions. And that was uh, and Kim, did you want to add anything on that? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, uh, that that kind of takes you through our timeline that I remember. Thank you, uh, Matt or John. Do you have anything to uh, add for your experience? Since this is our first time around, I'm taking notes from Ken about being ready ahead of time for grant opportunities and the like. So I would just say, be open to everything you can learn through the process. Thank you. All right, we have about 15 minutes left, so I'm going to go through my part of the presentation now, and um, we will wrap up shortly. Give Lisa a hey, second to- Hey, Stella. Yeah. This is Kevin. I, I noticed in the chat, there's a specific question that says, where are these lock boxes placed? Are oh, they yes. for firefighting equipment um, in far-flung locations? Um, I, I'd like to just specifically address that and say that um, within the code, these locks boxes um, are identified that they have to be located at the front of a building near the entrance. Um, they have to be um, basically um, uh, unbreakable. Uh, they have to be mounted either on the building or inside the structure of the building um, so that you know somebody can't just walk up to it and access them. Um, these are heavy duty boxes um, and they don't store firefighting equipment. They store the keys to the building. So only the fire department has access to these boxes. Um, and so I hope that answers their question that, that they're located in very conspicuous areas um, and they're, they're for businesses to adopt or, or for our fire department to adopt the codes and then businesses to adhere to it. Thank you for addressing that question. Awesome. Well, you hopefully have heard from our presenters a bit about what, you know, the code council has been able to do to assist them. But just to reiterate, we have on our website and it looks like several people have maybe been poking around the website over the last couple of days, but we have template applications available with some language for, you know, what some of those prompts are you saw on FEMA Go, which provide um, common examples of, you know, projects that we've seen um, be approved in the past for BRIC and BRIC codes plus up. And so you, you can um, fill out that form on our website and access those templates. We also have a blank one that has just all the questions from last year's FEMA Go um, application. As um, Sean and John noted, there may be some changes in the new um, NOFO, and those would be updated in FEMA Go. So, you know, just be mindful of making sure you're answering the exact question and tailoring things to your community. But if you feel like you don't know where to start with writing these narratives, uh, we have some of those examples available. We're also happy to connect you to others that may have done a similar project to your uh, what you're hoping to do or get ideas. Uh, we have a network of other um, ICC members who have been through this before and always happy to help make those connections. If there's ever any services like training, certifications, memberships, things like that that ICC can provide, we can connect you with those folks to get the information you need for your budgets. We can also be a partner on other grants. You know, um, there's other funding available besides BRIC or um, grants and um, building code initiatives. And ICC has been a partner with other communities through RECI. Um, we're happy to help support you as a training provider and other um, other ways that we can work together, helping you create a custom code, etc. Um, as um, Lisa just went to the next slide, we have 
All these are um, eligible things that you can use for grant funding that ICC provides. Obviously, there are other things beyond what we can do, such as knock boxes that you could use the BRIC funding for. Um, but if you're looking to digitize your code department, um, implement something like remote virtual inspections, if you have a lot of those um, urban or sorry, rural areas uh, that are hard to reach, or you're a one man team and you need that additional capacity to help um, get things done faster and more efficiently efficiently by updating your uh, processing. There's a lot of opportunities if you're looking to do building department accreditation, um, the list goes on. So if there's something you're thinking about doing, um, please review what's eligible on that um, document that um, was shared in the chat earlier about what FEMA qualifies as building code activities. And then we're also uh, available if you have questions and kind of want to talk through something further. Um, if you could go to the next slide, Lisa. Um, just to give um, some more examples, uh, this past year we supported about 50 jurisdictions between one-on-one -on -one calls, working with communities, um, using our template applications. Uh, so of that, 100 and um, I forget the exact number that um, John said, applied for brick building codes plus up. About 50 of those were ICC members that we connected with. So we'd love to work with you all again this year and help you support, um, you know, making their even more uh, brick codes plus up applications. Um, we have training available for building, uh, not building codes, but for uh, jurisdictions like yourselves to understand the federal grant basics and um, beyond brick, just navigating the federal grant process to support building code initiatives. And then we have our newsletter. So I'll share a um, QR code in a moment where you can sign up to stay up to date if you're not already on that. I know there was a question about how do I know when this NOFO comes out? Obviously, we have to get that news first from FEMA as well, but when we get that information about BRIC or other grants, we share that in our newsletter, update it on our website, and try to spread the word uh, through all of our channels. So if you're not already connected to us, please do so so that you can stay up to date. Uh, and then on our website as well with our federal grants page, if you'd like to have a meeting with me and learn more about what we can do, talk through a project. Um, we have, you know, connections at the state, not in every state, but uh, we're, we're happy to do our part to help connect you to the right resources in your state to help you um, have a successful application and work with your state partners to um, make sure that you can get your application in. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and this is just an example of some of the resources that we have on our website for the other grant opportunities. If you're looking to focus more on energy code, there is a lot of funding that DOE has, uh, and it can be hard to understand which grant is right for you, depending on what code you're on, what you're trying to do, what type of jurisdiction you are. So we have some resources like this to help kind of answer and figure out which program you should apply for funding through. Um, if you could go to the QR code slide, Lisa, thank you. Um, again, if you're interested in bringing our grant training, which, you know, this webinar is just about BRIC, but if you want to know just overall how to navigate the federal grant process, if you're a part of a chapter of ICC or another organization that this would be beneficial to, um, please sign up and express interest in bringing that training. Um, and then, I do, do we have the QR code for the webpage? There we go. It's like I made these slides. Um, so if you want to sign up for that eblast, please feel um, scan this QR code. Uh, you can also sign up on our website if you go to our iccsafe.org/federalgrants webpage. You can find all these resources. Once we do have our um, webinar recording and um, video of this updated, we'll update that on our BRIC webpage, same iccsafe.org slash BRIC. And we have last year's webinars as well. So if you want to dig in to more right now while we're waiting for the NOFO to come out, please feel free to review that information. Um, we have about eight minutes left today, so I will stop talking and see if there are any other questions. Um, and then I'll, I'll talk again if I have answers to those questions, but feel free to um, Drop any questions in the chat or the Q and A function uh, for myself or our other panelists. Thanks again for coming as well. If you have to hop off or um, don't want to stick around for any remaining questions.
I see a question about are applicants planning to adopt the 2024 I-code? So if um, anybody is on the call and wants to share their thoughts, if you're going to be using funding to um, support an adoption of the 2024 codes, um, we'd love to hear that. Um, it's not a requirement of the BRIC funding that you adopt the most recent code cycle, but um, it is intended to support um, up-to-date and uh, current building codes. So keep that in mind. Stella, here in uh, Virginia, we operate off of Virginia building code from the ICC codes. So we are always three years behind. So we are on the 2021 codes. But then as soon as the next ones are available, we'll be moving to them. Thank you. Um, from Utah's perspective, that's the same answer we have for, for ICODES. We're, we're 2021. Great. I see a question about the timing of when you might buy something um, that you're looking to get grant funding for. Great question. You would not want to spend any of the money on something um, that you would be seeking to use um, the grant funds for until you have that award. So um, during the application period, you don't want to do anything that you would be seeking to get reimbursed. Um, the only time in which you could potentially do that is once you've begun negotiations. If you have an agreement with FEMA or if you're working on another grant, and they've issued you a pre award cost letter, which says, um, you know, we're still working through things, but we're approving that you can attempt to get reimbursement for this once everything's done. But it's never a guarantee um, that if you spend any of that money, whether it's time or purchasing a material item, uh, equipment, and such, that you would be able to get that reimbursed until things are finalized with your grant award. So um, be careful about that for sure. All right, well, um, we'll stick around for the next five minutes if there are any other questions, but for those of you still on, um, hopefully we'll see you at the conference, the annual business meeting um, in a, just about a month in October over in Long Beach. I'll be there. Hopefully by then the NOFA will be out by brick. We'll, we can talk all things grants if you see me there, um, and we'll have a session where some other um, Communities will be sharing about their experience using brick during 1 of the insight sessions. So, if you would love to, um, or I would love to have you there. So, if you're attending the conference, please come visit that session and uh, learn more about how these grants can help your community on the resilience front. Um, there's a question in the chat about the closeout process after being awarded. Um, that is a great question. I. Personally, have not been in this role long enough to work with a community sort of through that phase. So um, I don't know that the communities on our um, presentation today either have they haven't received a brick award in the past. So um, the ones that we do know of, I think, are still sort of during the active award phase. So I don't know what that pre or sort of post um, award process is. But maybe John, um, if you're still on from FEMA, do you have any insights to what um, your process is for that closeout period? Um, like you, I haven't been at FEMA long enough to experience that yet. But so I I am your same boat. I am. OK, it looks like sure. Sean um, replied in the chat that there is a closeout. Um, but it hasn't been built out into the system yet. So there is definitely an element of sort of once your let's say your grant is three years long, it ends in December. After December, there's still some work that you have to do as far as reporting um, and closing out that award period. So uh, there's definitely a multi-year commitment with these grants. So it's something to be aware of and make sure that you have champions and those who know about that information if you have people retiring or switching positions, et cetera, so that you can continue to be successful once you have the award as well.
Great. Well, thanks everyone for taking time out of your Tuesday afternoon. I hope you have a wonderful afternoon or evening wherever you are. Um, please be on the lookout for uh, the notice of funding opportunity news when that comes out. And uh, it's never too early to start working on your application. So uh, hopefully this inspired you, gave some uh, good tips and tricks and ideas. And we look forward to working with you and supporting you through another successful BRIC cycle. Thanks everyone.